Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to our live stream today. Um, we want to thank you so much. Last week, your generosity was just out of sight. Um, we are navigating brand new waters. We have no idea how long this is going to take. We have faith that it's just going to be maybe another week or two. But in the meantime, I want to encourage you, if you're watching, please make sure that you continue to support your local church. Your local church is the hope of your city. Uh, they do, um, you know, they help feed people that, that don't have food. They help clothe people that don't have clothes and supports the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists that are called to uh, equip saints for the work of ministry. Um, we wanted to take just maybe three to five minutes this morning and teach just a little bit on giving. If people don't always know how these things sort out you know there's the, you know we hear the word tithe and we hear the word offering and sometimes there's a lot of confusion about them but the fact is what we find in the new testament is four ty four different types of giving that um that all have different motivations and different rewards so when you're giving this morning and you can give one of two ways and i'll explain those two when uh, when we're done with the teaching um when you're giving this morning, it's important that you understand your motivation. It's important that you understand your um, your reward. So the first one that we, we all talk about frequently is tithing. Tithing is defined as a 10% of your increase. Um, and that goes to your local church. A tithe is not an offering. A tithe is not an alm. And a tithe is not a seed. So the tithe was really simple in the Old Testament, the tithe was actually 33% of their income because there was actually four different tithes. Um, the way we understand it is to be 10% um, of your increase. But what that does is there was two, two purposes that it served. One, it took care of the Levites, the people that, that worked or were staffed by the church. And two, it made sure the storehouse was full. So that was the operating budget and the payroll. That's what the tithe covered. Now, anything over and above that, there was actually a separate offering taken, uh, taken up. Like when Moses wanted to build the temple, this could be your building project, he asked for offerings. And when he asked for offerings, the people brought so many offerings, he had to start turning people away because he had things that he had just stacks of resources and they had too much. So hopefully that's what your church is experiencing. Um, alms was a much different moment. This is when Jesus said, make sure your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing. This is when you help people. Um, that are less fortunate than you and obviously the the motivation for almsgiving is compassion and the reward is the bible says that when you give to somebody that's needy you lend to the lord so you should fully be expecting supernatural provision to be able to take care of people that don't have much that's the way this works um and the last one is seed sowing um seed sowing biblically financially was when you actually look for good soil that's that's one of the crazy things that's why alms and seed sowing is much different when i seed sow i find somebody that i respect um somebody that might be uh, doing really well financially and i actually give them money um and i tell them that i understand that they're really good at multiplying it and that that i want to plant that seed in their life and and have it return to them return to me 30 60 or 100 fold um so like i said they all have different motivations the tithing motivation is obedience it's because god says to but it says that if you do that your reward is that he rebukes the devourer and he rains down more blessings than you possibly have room for so it's a tremendous opportunity um in the kingdom wealth is always accumulated through generosity um after that what we'd see offerings offerings are basically for the uh extra essentials you know you might want to give to somebody because you like them you might want to give to a church project or a building project or whatever it might be um that is not part of your tithe the tithe comes because the church has to continue to function the gospel is free that's very clear um a lot of us have been affected by like poor handling of funds so we really don't think that giving to the church is a good idea um but when we see what the church does and we see that you know the the impact that she has then we come into agreement with god to to be able to foster those things um so the giving of an offering is participation that's why you're motivated because you want to be part of what god's doing so say that somebody's building a new building you want to be able to say that brick probably came from me um <coughs> and the reward is that he would bless you and that you would be able to benefit from exactly what that offering brought now i want to say something about tithes and offerings 
a lot of times people don't talk about their tithes and offerings. And the reason they don't talk about their tithes and offerings is because it says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand do and let your giving be done in secret. So the thing is, that's a little bit out of context and here's why. When it talked about not saying what you give, it was talking specifically about alms, giving to the poor. The reason you don't talk about when you give to the poor isn't because it's not something that you should be touting, it's because it's protecting the dignity of the person that you helped. So nobody likes to be the guy that had a need, right? So when you give to the poor, keep it to yourself. If you want to shout your tithe check from the rooftop, by all means do it, we'll help you. Um, that's, that's biblical. And then the last one, seed sowing. Um, its motivation is increase. So I always, you know, people give to me or give to the church. I'm like, you're going to be blessed for that. And they're like, that's not what it's about. And I'm like, actually it is. Read your Bible. Um, I think it would be pretty stupid to go till up the ground and plant a seed and then be like, I don't care if it grows. That just doesn't make sense. Um, but I can tell you this, that I am talking with a lot of pastors. Um, we're completely like just overwhelmed by the faithfulness of people because there's a fear that if people aren't gathering in a church building that they're not going to help support the the continuation of the you know the church during these times and i can tell you that you have and i'm so thankful um but i do want to remind you that that's that's imperative that we're all continually continually supporting our local churches so that we have a local church to go back to when it's all over so the two ways that you can give you can mail a check to Legacy Church. The, the address is 233 Front Avenue, Southwest, New Philadelphia, Ohio, 44663. Or you can text to give. All you have to do is put the amount in the message line and text it to the number 330-400-3223. And that will send you an, a link. If you've never set it up before, you just log in, put your information in a secure portal, and then you're able to set up either repeating or one-time payments of whatever you'd like to give. So we trust that as you give, it'll be multiplied back to you, and that the seed that you sow, you will re restore or reap a hundredfold um, <coughs> blessing, and that you really need to know that we're genuinely thankful for your continued support. So thank you guys, and we love you, and I hope you enjoy the message that's coming. Hey, good morning, Legacy. Happy Sunday. I hope everybody's doing well, and we're excited that you came to watch our live stream this morning. I hope nobody's going crazy because of the late quarantine, and I hope you guys are all finding time to spend time in the Word and with your families and uh, making the absolute best of this moment in history that we have. So before we jump into the Word this morning, I wanted to open in prayer, and I wanted to pray for everybody that's uh, that's maybe shut out, that's, that's without wages, and and it's, it's re the responsibility of sons and daughters to call the provision of heaven into a moment like this. So if we could all take a moment, I know there's probably a few hundred of us able to watch this this morning. So uh, let's come into agreement that we're going to pray over this word, that we're going to pray over this moment in time, and that we're going to see some of the greatest things that the kingdom has ever seen come on the heels of one of the craziest times that you and I will ever live through. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to be a light in a dark place. And Father, we just ask that you enable us, that you empower us, that you teach us to be exactly who you would be in this time. We would be provision, you'd be healing, you'd be dominion, and that you would do what heaven does. Father, let us be a people that only say what you're saying and only do what you're doing. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And we all said amen. So we're going to start a series today entitled Align. And I believe it's a timely series because a lot of us are in a position that we've never been in before. One of the best ways to expose the condition of your soul is to let it rest. A lot of us today do one of the most dangerous things that, that people can do, and it's that we get addicted to busy. And when you and I are addicted to busy, we don't have an opportunity to actually confront some of the things that are buried deep down and uh, some of the things that we're unable to excavate because we don't have to address them when, uh, when there's no time to be quiet. We don't have to address them when there's nothing catastrophic going on around us that would pull them from us. 
So I want to start today <clears throat> by bringing a concept to you about being double-minded. And uh, I'm not going to rebuke double-mindedness. I'm going to explain it. Sometimes there's terms in the Bible that, that we hear over and over and over, and they, they, they make themselves to be Christianese terms. They're nothing that we actually understand. Um, they're more of a concept than they are a conviction. We don't really know maybe the background. We don't really know perhaps the implications that it may have on us, but I do want to try to explain something. I know the book of James says that if you're a double-minded man, you're unstable in all your ways and that you shouldn't suppose that you'd receive anything from the Lord. And I, I don't think any of us want to be in that situation. So I want to explain double-mindedness in a very practical way. And I want to try to give all of us a grasp on what our humanity looks like and how God formed us and how God designed us to operate. This teaching is obviously going to roll out in probably four consecutive teachings, and it's basically all around developing and manifesting the mind of Christ. But if we don't understand <coughs> excuse me, the, the issues that we have with our mind currently, and, and maybe where some of those problems came from, it's probably really tough for us to try to reconcile things in the Bible that say that you and I have the mind of Christ, or that we're supposed to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So I think this will be super practical. A lot of you that maybe haven't heard me teach before, this will be brand new to you. But uh, we always want to make sure that we understand what God has done. Rather than trying to figure out what we should do, we should always try to figure out what God has done. So in order for us to do that, we need to go to Genesis to look at his original intention for humanity so we can understand double-mindedness. I'm going to teach you some things about Satan and the way he operates today so that, that you can have a better idea of his tactics because his tactics are way more cunning than you and I would, would than, than he would even have us be led to believe they are. But uh, I'm going to give you some things that will help you identify those and uh, show you what happened and why we struggle with our minds so much now and show you what God has already done to make sure that you and I can have peace of mind and not be double-minded going forward. So we're going to start in Genesis, verse 1, excuse me, chapter 1, <coughs> um, verse 26 through 28. So this is the creation account of humanity. So the first thing he says is, let God, excuse me, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God is, is clearly bringing something new into creation that looks just like him. So um, let me move a little bit forward. It says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and everything that creeps on the earth. So what we need to understand here, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, is God fashioned you as a human in a very specific way. As a matter of fact, everything that God made from Genesis, from day one to day five, God spoke into existence. He stopped speaking things into existence when he started fashioning men. Then he formed man out of the dust of the earth with his own hands. So you and I are completely different species than the rest of creation. We were literally formed in his image. But if we don't look at the process for our formation, then we will mistake this body we're in for our, our personality or our identity. So what happens is God <clears throat> created us in his image, and then he formed a dirt body for us and placed us in the dirt body. So it's really easy for you and I to look at this dirt body because it's the most real thing that we can find and be identified by it. But the image of God is made in the image of an invisible spirit. So God is invisible. He's the invisible God. That's clearly what it says in scripture. So the most real component of your humanity is an invisible component. It's called your spirit. And then he took that living spirit and he placed it in a dirt body and he created the species that he would now say, let them have dominion. So when God uses specific pronouns like that, it's important that we understand that he's not nonchalantly throwing out verbiage. So if <clears throat> if I were to create something and I said, um, okay, I'm going to make this table and I'm going to let that table have dominion. Um, 
I would be releasing myself from the dominion and, and assigning that task to another. So we see all through the Bible this theme of, you know, the heavens, yes, even the heavens belong to God, and the earth he has given into the, the, the hands of men or the, to the sons of men. So that species that he placed here was a spiritual man living inside a dirt body that was to govern the increase of God's creation. That is, that is strictly the reason you were born was to be God's co-regent and co-governor and co-heir on this planet to govern the increase of his peace and his kingdom. That's why we're here. So <clears throat> in Genesis 3, we have this moment where Satan comes to deceive Eve. Um, it's in that moment that we can finally make double-mindedness make sense. And I don't want to go, I don't want to make this too academic because this is so important because these same kind of things are happening to you and I day in and day out. So God showed Adam and Eve all around the garden. He said, you can eat all of these trees, anything that you want to eat. Just don't eat of that tree, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat of that tree, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. So a few things that we have to ask ourselves. One, is this one of those weird poetic versions of the word day? I don't think so. Because just two chapters prior, he said, God, you know, put a great light in the day and a little light at night. And when they spun, that was the first day. So God was totally literal when he called a 24 hour period or 24 and a quarter hour period one day. So he says in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. So he's not talking about a future death. He's talking about a, an instant death that takes place whenever they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now there's boatloads of revelation behind that, that you and I will save for another time. But what I do want you to understand is that when God communicates with humanity, He's not communicating with their flesh. He's communicating with the component of them that was made in his image, which is their spirit. So if he's talking to a spirit saying, in the day that you eat of it, you will die, he's not talking about a physical death. A physical death was the end result of ultimately a spiritual death. But the day that they ate of the tree, Adam and Eve became spiritually destitute. So it wasn't a lie. Um, we couldn't trust God if, if he was talking about physical death, but we know that because he's talking about spiritual death, that humanity became spiritually inept at that moment, which is why the concept born again makes sense. You can't understand born again if you don't understand dead first. So <clears throat> it's in this moment that you and I can understand the two modes of operation that, that you and I can be living in at either time. So Satan comes to Eve and he says, Surely you won't die. He, he questions Eve. He says, did God say that you couldn't eat any of these trees? And she said, no, God said we could any, eat any of the trees except for that tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said the day that we eat of it or touch it, we'll die. And Satan said, that's foolishness. He said, you won't die when you eat it. As a matter of fact, when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God and you'll know good and evil. Now, this is, this is where it gets tricky because Satan wasn't lying either. If you really look at the narrative, you have two parallel stories going on right here. You have a spiritual story and you have a carnal story. You have a spiritual mind and you have a carnal mind. So <clears throat> God's speaking to the spirit. He said, you can eat anything you want. Just don't, don't eat of that tree. The day that you eat of that tree, you'll surely die. Satan comes and he, he appeals to Eve's flesh or her fallen mind, her natural mind. And he says, surely you won't die, but in the day that you eat of it, you'll be, your eyes will be open. You'll be made like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, so do you see these two parallel themes going on? So the thing about this is, we need to understand that God will always tell the truth about the invisible reality called heaven and the invisible people called spirits. Spirits of just men made perfect. Now here's the kicker. Satan will tell the truth about natural and fallen wisdom. Because if you read the narrative, they did not physically die. So it looks like Satan told the truth and their eyes were opened. That, that's biblical. That's not something you have to search hard for. It says that their eyes were opened. They saw each other, they were naked and they found fig leaves to cover themselves. <clears throat> 
So what we see happen in that moment is there was a creation that God placed here to govern and that creation became perverted in its design in the fact that it became spiritually dead so its connection with God was cut off. And in that moment, our eyes were opened and our carnality gained a perspective. Now let me explain to you what's wrong with that. <clears throat> now, you and I called to govern the increase of all of God's creation just became subject to the thing that we were supposed to reign over. How? Now, everything that you and I experience with our senses becomes our operating system and essentially becomes our interpretation of the future. If you want to understand your anxiety and you want to understand your depression and you want to understand your sadness, then you have to come to the place where you understand this. Because what happens is you essentially walk back first into the future. Meaning, you know, for, for some of you or some of us or whatever, the, the early parts of our lives weren't really the most tremendous thing that we could ever talk about. Um, you might have been abused by your parents and then you were rejected by your first love and then you were beaten by, you know, four boyfriends in a row and then whatever. And, and, and then your senses, your eyes that have been opened because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now start to give you an interpretation of what's coming in your future. So your only anticipation of what's going to be is what has been. And the way that your mind, your fallen mind is, is operated, excuse me, is wired to operate is actually really consequential when it comes to, to creating a good future for you. Because this is what happens. When you endure trauma, your, your body tells you to, to create a really solid memory around it. Like, <clears throat> you probably don't remember... Christmas when you were two, three, and four years old because those things didn't hurt you. But you probably remember getting attacked by a dog when you were four and a half. And that's your body's way of protecting itself. So that is the fallen nature. That's the way it works. Now now you have this message in your mind that you're afraid of a dog. So now you'll be afraid of dogs for the rest of your life because your brain specifically and intentionally created terrible emotions that surround these four-legged furry creatures. So now your only interpretation of what's going to happen is what has happened, and then you're not excited about dogs anymore. Now what happens when that's your life? You know, dad disappointed you, mom disappointed you, um, all you've ever been is neglected and rejected and fearful. So now at some point you get to, to, to a point in your adulthood or your young or old adolescence, and now you only have one thing that you're waiting for, and it's more disappointment. It's more fear, it's more trauma, it's more tragedy. So that's why you and I, <clears throat> weren't just given a gospel that will save our spirits someday and make sure that we're not punished eternal, eternally in a lake of fire. You and I were given the ability to be our created self, which is a living spirit with a body that's in subjection. So look back to Genesis. We have a body made in the image, excuse me, a, a spirit made in the image of God placed in a dirt body to reign over everything on earth. What happened is now everything on earth is perceived by our opened eyes that came through the knowledge of sin and, excuse me, of good and evil, and it affects our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. So if your only interpretation of the future is what you physically experienced in the past, how many of you understand that not very many of us will have much hope? As a matter of fact, most of us will spend most of our days just wanting to be sleeping or wanting to be dead or wishing... You know, the last person that beat us would have beat us a little harder. You know, these, these things are legitimate. They're real. But what, what I'm really, frankly, tired of is people preaching a gospel that's not applicable to real life. It's just a get out of hell free card and hope you make it when the day comes. That's not the way this is supposed to be. All old things have passed away. And now behold, all things become new. So now we need to understand that when you put faith in Christ... You get born again. I mean, that's that's great news. The reason it's great news is because that component of your humanity that was formerly dead is now quickened back to life and not just quickened back to life. The Bible says that if you believe in the Lord, you become one spirit with the Lord. So the spirit that's living in you is literally the spirit of God. Your spirit and his spirit are unified 
division is a deception. It's not a real thing. So you and God are one. So now what happens is, is, is instead of being defined by who rejected you, who, who left you, who hurt you, who beat you, now you're defined by his victory over hell, death, and the grave, and his seat at the right hand of God in heavenly places. And now everything that can be said of him can be said of you, and nothing that can be said of, excuse, excuse me, nothing that can't be said of him can be said of you. You're everything he is, and you're nothing that he's not, and now you have the opportunity to to, to come into alignment or agreement with that and, and, and not allow yourself to be terrified of what's going to happen to you the next day. <clears throat> now, I know some of these things, like I said, address some very real issues, and I know that there's going to be a lot of real people watching this, um, but I have seen uh, way too many people sit in church for 20 or 30 years and, and carry the the same pain that they brought in the door the first day. I'm here to tell you that God has a plan for you to prosper you and not harm you, to give you hope in a future. That's, that's the whole deal, man. It's not about dying. It's about living. It's not about making it out of here someday. It's about bringing heaven here now so that you can show people what hope in heaven look like. It's, it's got nothing to do with escaping. That is the most selfish gospel that you and I could ever subscribe to. It's about admonishing a sacrifice, a perfect savior enough that we're willing to, to say that what he went through is more important than what I went through. And if he says I'm brand new, then I'm not going to allow the actions of twisted people in my life to define me anymore. The one who made you and the one who paid for you, the, that is what defines you. Um, it's, it's good stuff. It's, these are the kind of moments or messages that have set me free. So um, I'm going to continue and, uh, and show you a few things. Let's go to John 3, and I'll explain this born-again concept. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, I do want to address the born again concept and I don't want to make anybody mad, but born again is not salvation. It's not different from or a separate experience, but born again does way more than just get you into heaven. I guess that's what I'd really like to say. So Nicodemus was a guy, um, that you and I probably could relate to. Um, a lot of the religious folks could relate to because he had, everything going for him. He was on the top rung of the religious ladder. He would have been a very wealthy man. He would have been a well-respected man. But when Jesus steps on the scene, he finally understands that there's something he doesn't have. He comes to Jesus by the cover of nightfall because he's scared of what the rest of his religious thug buddies are going to think. But he has a question burning in him that's the same question you and I have. It's like, why? how do I get to live the way you live? What do I do that you do? Now, please understand that Nicodemus isn't a down-and-out junkie drug addict stripper like most of us were, right? He is the guy that's got it going on. And even though he's got it physically, naturally going on, he understands that there's something that Jesus has that he does. And here's how Jesus responds. So this is verse 1. So I'm going to kind of recap the story. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews and he came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher that's come from God because nobody can do the signs that you do unless God's with him. Jesus answered and said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it might look like Jesus sidestepped his question, but Jesus didn't sidestep his question at all. He answered it directly. If Nicodemus said, you're doing things that we can't do. Jesus is ascribing those things to the kingdom that he's a part of. So he said, I'm telling you, if you want to do what I do, you got to be, where, be from where I'm from, and you have to be born from where I'm born from. That's why he says you have to be born again to see the kingdom, kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> a lot of you that are watching may have not heard our teachings before. This is something we actually talk about pretty commonly. Is entering the kingdom of God has nothing to do, zero to do, with where you go when you die. The, the word kingdom was the Greek word basileia. And what basileia meant was the right to reign as the creator. So the kingdom was not a place that you go. It is a reality. It's actually a government where God's in charge of everything. So 
Jesus is saying that the reason I can do what I do is because I live according to a different government. I live according to God's rules. I live according to God's perspective. I base my judgments on the way God thinks, the way he feels, and the things that he does. So that's much different <coughs> than being governed by the things that are happening in a visible reality because your eyes have been opened because of the fallen nature. So um, Nicodemus totally doesn't understand that clearly because he asks if he can get in his mom's womb a second time. But all he understands is natural birth. And Jesus refutes that and says, you have to be born of water and the spirit. Now, another thing we'll address is that has nothing to do with water baptism and spirit baptism. That's not the, how this works. Jesus is going back to Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, we have men who are spirits in a body. And Jesus is saying you have to be born of water. What does that mean? That means you have to have a mother. You have to be born of the water of the womb so that you can possess the dirt body that you were created to have. And you have to be born of the spirit. That means you have to be born through faith in Christ so that your spirit is quickened back to life. You have to have a body and a spirit to access the kingdom. That's exactly what he's saying. He's talking about putting back together that thing that broke in Genesis chapter 3. That's the puzzle. That's the solution to Nicodemus' issues. No matter how hard I work, I just can't get there. And you just show up on the scene. You're living from your identity. And he's like, it's because I live according to a different perspective. I have a different mind. I see things. I discern things spiritually. I govern things spiritually. Uh, the wisdom that I receive has nothing to do with the things that I see. It's about the things that the Father knows. So <clears throat> Jesus continues and he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said this to you that you have to be born again. Check this out. He said the wind blows where it wishes. You can hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from. Or where it goes. That's how it is for everyone that's born of the Spirit. So Jesus is indicating that what he's seeing right now is the effects of an invisible reality. He said, people that are born again are like the wind. You can't tell where they came from, but you can see their effects. He's telling us, he's revealing to us that being born again gives us that heavenly residence. You can't see where we come from. But that Spirit manifests in our body so you can see what we do. We have an invisible origin with visible effects. That's how the kingdom works. So now you and I have the opportunity to make this make sense, okay? So Matthew 4, 17. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, everything that we just discussed will make this moment make more sense because <clears throat> God created us to have a spiritual mind that governed a dirt body. After the fall, we had a dead spirit and open eyes in that dirt body that was governed by the things that were going on around us. We could only ever be as good as it's going. And then that fed our emotions, and then our emotions became our body's taskmaster. That's why people get sick all the time. Have you ever noticed that people who are depressed are also physically ill? There's actually a cellular response to every negative thought that you have in your head. You can think yourself sick, and you can think yourself well. That's science. You don't even have to be a biblical scholar to understand that. Scientists understand that. <clears throat> but Matthew 4, 17 now gives us the instructions. It's super simple, but we don't understand this when it comes to having a, a, a mindset of the kingdom because most of us are worried about getting to heaven when we die rather than dominating while we live. Jesus' message is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The word repent has nothing to do with turning away from bad behaviors. It has nothing to do with saying you're really sorry and being, oh, what's the, what is the, being sorry for your actions, so sorry that you change what you're doing. That, that, that's not a definition of repentance in the New Testament. It's just not. The word repent in the New Testament means to change one's mind. That is the simple definition. The second definition is a fundamental shift in paradigm. It means to stop thinking like you used to think and start thinking like God thinks. So repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So if you're a religious person and you and you interpret that according to your paradigm rather, in, in, rather than interpreting according to truth, 
you'll think that means stop being bad because you're going to heaven soon. But what it means is you have to start thinking differently because heaven's here and you have a spiritual arena, you have a spiritual atmosphere, a spiritual reality to be able to access it. And you can't access the spiritual reality with the way that you used to think because you always disqualify yourself because you'll be able, you'll be governing yourself based on the rejection and shame and fear and guilt that's led you up to this point in your life. So you need to be okay with saying, I repent. And when you say I repent, that doesn't mean that you're going to do things differently. Ultimately, you will do things differently because you now you're going to partner with the mind of Christ instead of the mind that you've made through your experiences and through your upbringing. So <clears throat> it is super important that you and I as Christians take time to pay attention to our thought life. It's really important that we understand that, that accessing the kingdom, the promises that you and I are called to, is actually a mind shift away. That's what repent means. You're a mind shift away from accessing heaven. And you can't be double-minded. Double-minded men receive nothing from the Lord. So if you're being governed by the thing that you're afraid of that you see, and you're trying to be governed by the promise that you know, though always be at enmity with one another. The fact is, you and I need to come to a place where there is no plan B for us anymore. What he says goes, and what he says is truth. And let God be true and every other man be a liar. That's the way this, this has to work for us. So, um, when it comes to thinking, I, I like to be practical about this. Because most of the issues that I see in marriages, most of the issues that I see with people with depression and anxiety, I'll be like extremely pointed with what I'm about to say. I understand that there are such things as chemical imbalances. What doctors are starting to find now is those chemical imbalances are actually the result of bad thought patterns and they're not the cause of them. So you can change the thought pattern, which is really hard, and then you can change the balance. But most of the time, and please hear me with a compassionate heart, we do not want to work hard enough. We do not want to believe strong enough. And we do not think that God is good enough to put his mind in place of our mind. It is counterintuitive. It is difficult for you and I to not be governed by things that we've seen all of our lives and to begin to be governed by what he says that we're just learning now. So we saw in Genesis that God gave a narrative, Satan gave a narrative. Both of them were true narratives based on the um, atmosphere that they were living in. God gave the spiritual side, Satan gave the carnal side. So if you're ill right now, you know your doctor's uh, slip might be staring you in the face with a bad diagnosis, but Satan would come to you and say, you can see it, right? Therefore, it must be real. And then Jesus is saying, by his stripes, you're healed. So that's a perfect opportunity to choose which reality you're going to partner with and which one you're going to allow govern your decisions and your mind and your joy and the peace that you carry. So <clears throat> I promise you, that you can always find an excuse not to think right. You can always find a reason to not put your mind to work for heaven's cause. Because it's way easier. You will never know what it costs you to not think correctly until you're at the end of your life and you realize that you lived it in sorrow and depression instead of choosing joy when you woke up that morning. One of the things my wife always says, there's a doctor named Carolyn Leaf that, that wrote a book on neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, two topics that you should take the time to study. But um, neurogenesis is the concept that your brain literally produces unprogrammed brand new brain cells every morning. So if you're choosing a life of repentance, then you can tell your brain cells every day when you wake up that you want a life of joy, a life of righteousness, and a life of peace. And if you're not willing to tell them that, because it's like training a dog, it is. it takes so much less work to, to train and discipline and, and make a dog obedient. It takes so much less work to just 
let them run amok. You can sit on the couch all day. But the fact is, listen to me well, they will destroy everything around you, even though you didn't have to work very hard because you didn't train them. Inevitably, you will lose everything. Your thought life is the same way. It takes tenacity to replace fallen thoughts with God's thoughts. It takes toughness to choose joy when everything sucks. It takes a boldness, a holy boldness to argue with yourself, to stand outside of yourself and say that thought in my head would be foolish in the mind of my Jesus. Therefore, I am not permitting myself to think that thought and I will take the thought out of Jesus's heart and I'll put it in my mind and I will allow that to govern me. That is not an easy task. You have to walk it out. But listen, just like a small dog, if you're willing to put in the time, if you're willing to, to discipline and prepare and train and, and make it obedient, then guess what? You sustain the things that are going on around you. You get something that is, is long-term enjoyable because when you put the work into renewing your mind, the kingdom is what you get to access. So I promise you, listen, wives, husbands, sons, daughters, listen, you've all been through a lot of things. We know that, we understand that, but the gospel came to make all things new. So you might not want to put the effort in to taking your own thoughts, thoughts captive, but I promise your twisted thinking will, will cost you everything. Your kids, your husbands, your wives, your employers, you will stay a victim for the rest of your life and you will demand that everyone appease you because you don't feel justified because of the pain that you've been through in the past. I promise you, I completely feel compassion for you but here's what i want i want you to know that you're blameless spotless and perfect in the beloved and you no longer have to be defined by those things there's a much better life ahead of you than that and i know that that's what god has for you so if you do nothing about it that's fine just plan on having everything around you crawl or excuse me fall to pieces if you choose to get on board now and and allow God to start changing the way you think, then you'll repent and you'll access the kingdom because it's right near you. Um, I promise, these, these are the things that I wrote down here for a moment. If you're young, you might think that you're too happy to think because nothing's wrong when you're young. If you're young, make sure that you're taking your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. If you're in the prime of your life and you're working and you're making money, you're probably too busy to think well. I promise you that it is important that you maintain Christ-like attitude. When you're getting older, you might be too aged to think because older hearts seem to get harder. When you're dying, it's I'm too sick to think. You're weak, suffering, and you're alone. And when you're dead, it's too late to think. So it's important that no matter what phase of your life you're in, you take a moment or moments to make sure that you're not being governed by the things that you've been through, that you're being governed by the victories that he's apprehended for you. So um, I'm almost... Okay, this is how I'll finish then. I've got four things <coughs> that all of us need to be consistently aware of when it comes to our thought life. Things that we don't think about very frequently. And here's number one. Number one is spiritual warfare is all fought in the mind. Your flesh is not the problem. So you hear a lot of churches talk about spiritual warfare being between you know angels and demons and rebuking Satan and stuff like that. But realistically, Satan's a defeated foe. Hell, death, and the grave have been overcome. So enemies that have been defeated aren't real enemies. If you want to find the enemy of God in the Bible, you'd find it in the book of Romans. Chapter 8, it says that the carnal mind is the enemy of God. So all spiritual warfare takes place between your ears. It's not a matter of what's going on around you. It's not a matter of, you know, creepy things knocking pictures off your walls. Those things might be happening because of the way that you're thinking 
in the way that you're coming into agreement with things that are trying to lie to you. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, my wife did a tremendous job sharing on this on our Tuesday q and A. I'd suggest that you go back and listen to her, her view of it. I'm just going to mention it quickly. It says that we walk in the flesh, but we don't battle according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So there's three things he mentions, strongholds, <coughs> high things, and arguments. Now, all three of those things are thoughts. A stronghold is any reasoning that justifies your dysfunction. Let me explain that to you just for a moment. For some reason, my wife and I have spent a lot more time counseling uh, abused women than abused men. So um, seems my examples usually go that direction just because statistically there's a lot more women that have been through uh, battering, rejection, abuse than men. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of speak from that angle just to try to help the majority of our listeners. So a stronghold could be this. Um, you don't like to be intimate with your husband, um, not just physically, but uh, emotionally. You've got walls built, I think is the word that we use now. I've got my walls up. Why do you have your walls up? Well, last time I let them down, um, you know, I was hurt, rejected, misused, and abused. So that is a reasoning that justifies your dysfunction. I went through this, so now I'm not everything that God called me to be. That's a stronghold. That's something that's keeping you from experiencing the fullness of the joy of marriage that God has called you to. Now, you can apply that to absolutely anything. Any reason that you continue to believe less about yourself than what God says you are, which is everything he is. So why aren't you blameless? Well, you don't know where I've been. That's a stronghold. You don't know what I've done. That's a stronghold. Well, you're, you can raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out lepers. Well, you don't know how weak I am or how, much, how little faith I have. That's a stronghold. You need to get over those things. The next thing he says is uh, an argument. Now, the word argument actually was interpreted a computation. Um, those are the what ifs. Um, just to prove to you how subtly Satan through, works through what ifs, how many good what ifs do you have? If you uh, see like New Philadelphia Police Department call your phone, how many of you are like, maybe they found my wallet with a thousand dollars in it? That never happens. You're like, did I get a parking ticket? Who died? Did they find my husband in a hotel room with a woman? Like, your what ifs completely destroy your mind. And how many of you, if you count it up statistically, how many of your what ifs have actually come to pass? You realize that you really spent a lot of really bad time what ifing your way into depression. I heard the statement the other day that that anxiety is actually just conspiracy theory about yourself. It's just what ifing until you've what ifed yourself enough that you believe something bad is impending no matter what, even though it's probably never going to come. Those are arguments, computations. Now, the next thing is pulling down uh, high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Now, I've always been of the opinion that you and I have different high things. Everybody has a different high thing. What do you have in your life that's just bigger than God says he is? Is it finances? Is it your marriage? Is it your wayward kids? Is it your addiction? Whatever. But the fact is, this all comes back to the same principle. Strongholds, arguments, and high things are all thought processes. So they all have the same solution. It says take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So if you can take these what ifs or these justifications or these lofty things that are bigger than God out of your head and put them in Jesus's and still think they look normal, then, then you can keep them in your head. But if you would allow the mouth, excuse me, the words that come out of your mouth, come out of Jesus's mouth and they would sound like nonsense, then you should not permit yourself to say them either. If you can't take the thought out of your head and put it in Jesus's and it looked normal, then you shouldn't, then, 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 then you shouldn't have those thoughts either. If your thought looks like nonsense being in Jesus's mind, then you have his mind and you shouldn't think a way that he doesn't think. You can't afford it. It'll cost you. It'll destroy everything around you. Um, number two. You have to have an awareness of your creative nature. So the very first thing we started with is God saying, let them have dominion. So humanity has dominion on earth. That means nothing happens on earth without human agreement. Now, if you take a moment to listen to what I just said, you won't, you won't want to, uh, you want to park there for a little while. 
Because when God gave humanity dominion, he actually wrote himself out of, the, out of the dominion story from day one. I know some of you religious folks might not like that, but the fact is, we know that without God, men can't do anything. But without men, God won't do anything. He can, but he wouldn't be being sovereign after he granted humanity dominion. So you and I have to come to a place where we're okay with our creative nature. That means if we agree with it, we allow it to manifest. Faith. You're always walking in faith. Always walking in faith. It's just, what are you believing in? Because whatever you're believing in, you're giving permission to manifest. You're, you're exchanging your currency of faith for an invisible reality at all times. So anxiety, fear, and depression, you're actually empowering the very thing that you don't want to come to pass. If you partner with the mind of Christ, you're empowering heaven to come to earth. That's how this whole deal works. Um, number three, we have to have an awareness that our thoughts aren't our own. So the, the cool thing about your mind is it's impossible of producing a thought. It can only produce a memory. So everything that you've been through is either a communication from your experience or a communication from heaven. So you can't become something you've never seen or heard. You can't think something you've never seen or heard. So you have to understand that <coughs> if you're laying there in bed at night and you're thinking, I don't think anybody loves me. I should just kill myself. That thought has to have an origin outside of your own psyche because you can't produce a thought. You have to get it from somewhere else. So you have to ask yourself the question first, is Jesus laying in bed right now saying, I don't think anybody loves me. I should just kill myself. And if he's not, which clearly he isn't, you have to be okay with saying, Satan, not today, man. Like, it's not going to happen. And if you really boil this all down, Satan's tactic is simply to give you his thoughts. He has no future. He's been rejected by God. He's extremely lonely, and he's going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. He's already condemned. So most of your thoughts aren't a thought that came from nowhere. It's just Satan wanting you to feel how he feels. Lonely, depressed, in despair, rejected, and hopeless. So those are the times that you're able to say, I'm not coming into agreement with that. I'm taking it captive to the obedience of Christ, and he's going to punish everything that's disobedient when my obedience is fulfilled. Number four. <clears throat> there is always an alternative reality. Everything that you see, everything that you experience, and everything that, you, that that's coming at you right now has a, has a heavenly alternative. And I'm going to read from Psalm 23, probably my favorite psalm, just to, to show you that there's two things simultaneously going on right here. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Ready? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Okay, so <clears throat> there's two things held in tension right here that you might have looked right over. There's a fight and there is a feast going on simultaneously. Your enemies are coming against you and your Savior is trying to feed you. I'm going to leave you with this today. Will you go fight or will you go eat? Because I promise you that intimacy with your Savior is way more important than putting out all the fires around you. And you will become exhausted of trying to chase your tail around and get, in, get out of the hamster wheel that's called life until you understand that you have two minds. You can be governed by either one of them. One of them is going to put you in a grave early and the other one's going to give you life and peace. So thank you guys for listening. Um, like I said, this was the introduction to a four-week series. Um, hopefully by next week or the week after we're meeting back in our church building. Um, but in either case, please uh, comment, leave your feedback. We really want to know that this was a blessing to you. Um, and if you have questions, I will jump on and I will answer them for you. So thank you guys so much. We love you and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.